Underwood and Flinch Written and read by Mike Bennett This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Episode 13 Michelle stepped out onto the front patio of La Reina de Corazones and shielded her eyes from the sun. Over at their usual table in the corner sat two rather dishevelled-looking Bensons. She smiled and sauntered over. "'Oh, hello. Looks like you two could do with the hair of the dog. Late night, was it?' Cynthia, who had not long ago showered off the coagulating blood of José Almonte, turned her sunglasses in Michelle's direction. Whatever benefits Cynthia might have derived from ingesting human blood, hangover relief wasn't one of them. "'Yes.' she murmured. What was the occasion? And why wasn't I invited? Oh, no occasion. Just midlife exuberance. Midlife? said Gerald. <laughs> I wish. We're a bit past that benchmark, Sin. You may be, Gerald. I, however, remain forever forty, and damn the calendar's contradictions. It was mid-morning, and the bar was still quiet before the swell of lunchtime trade. Michelle pulled out a chair and sat down. "'Good for you, Cynthia. You don't look a day over thirty-nine. I don't know how you do it.' "'Flatterer,' said Cynthia. "'Seriously, though, you do look young for your age. What with all those fags you smoke and the sunshine? What's your secret?' "'Early to bed, early to rise, and a daily facial in my own urine.' Michelle grimaced. "'Oh, you're kidding!' A smile played at the corners of Cynthia's mouth. "'All right. The early-to-bed thing is something of a fib.' "'No!' Michelle patted Cynthia's arm. "'I'm talking about the urine. You're having me on, aren't you? You don't really wash in your own wee.' "'I wish I could. It's supposed to work wonders.' I read an interview once with an octogenarian actress who had the face of a wood nymph, and she swore by it. So, in a moment of madness or stupidity, I did once give it a go, but just the once. Michelle looked mildly appalled. Oh, what was it like? Pungent is the word that springs to mind. Did it work? At making me smell like a urinal? Yes. At making me look younger, sadly, no. Gerald chuckled and squeezed Cynthia's knee. No, now it's back to bathing in the blood of virgins, eh, Sin? Cynthia shot Gerald a look. I think you mean Radox, Gerald. She swatted his hand from her knee. Oh, yes, sorry, uh, that was uh, Ingrid Pitt, wasn't it? Countess Dracula. Cynthia turned to Michelle. "'Gerald has an Ingrid Pitt fetish, dear. He squandered his youth, firming at the mouth, amongst other places, gawping at her from the back row of the cinema. "'I've never heard of her,' said Michelle. "'Who's she when she's at home?' "'She's an actress. She popped up, or out, might be a better word, in certain horror films in the sixties. You know the sort of thing.' Heaving cleavage, heaving cleavage rises again, taste the blood of heaving cleavage, and so on. Michelle gave Gerald's shoulder an affectionate shove. Oh, did you have a crush on her then, Gerald? Gerald's cheeks flushed pink. Well, perhaps I did, yes. Just a, a small crush. Did, said Cynthia. Do is more like it. "'You know, Michelle, if they made Ingrid Pitt masks, "'I'd be spending most of my nights lying on my back, "'gasping through a rubber-fanged mouth-hole, "'with Mr. Small Crush here putting a big crush on my pelvis.' "'Oh, nonsense!' Gerald chortled. "'I'd never ask you to wear a mask, Sin. "'Not unless it was a mask of your own lovely face.' "'Which, of course, would be rather pointless.' "'Oh, aren't you sweet, Gerald?' said Michelle. "'Yes, isn't he?' 
said Cynthia. Weird, but sweet. Oh, said Gerald, opening his newspaper. Speaking of masks, or heads anyway, there's a bit in today's, uh, yesterday's mail about that chap that lost his head in Ibiza. Michelle felt a sudden knot of anxiety in her stomach. Keith's horror following his nightmare of this morning was still fresh in her mind. She looked away to where Louise was tending the bar. Did he need any help, she wondered. Oh, must we, Gerald? said Cynthia, stroking her brow wearily. Can't it wait until we've each had at least one Bloody Mary? Michelle brightened. What was that? Two Bloody Marys? She got up. Yes, please, Michelle, two, and some painkillers, if you have any. Here it is, said Gerald, opening out the pages on the table. Look! He tapped a photograph beneath the headline, Britain decapitated in Spanish gangland slaying. Says here his name was Mark Coleman. Michelle saw the picture, and her hand went involuntarily to her mouth. The picture wasn't recent. It was a family snapshot that looked like it had been taken some years ago. But Michelle recognized the face immediately. He'd been a regular at their pub in Benidorm. She'd known he'd been a part of Keith's little drug clique, but she'd always thought that Keith had been dealing to him. However, after Keith's confession this morning, she now knew the opposite to be true. "'Michelle, are you all right?' asked Gerald. Uh, "'Yeah,' Michelle looked up, smiling. "'Yeah, it, it's just a bit shocking, isn't it? it?' "'Says here that he may have been involved in the murder of this fellow.' Gerald tapped one of two other faces further down the article. Michelle looked. She couldn't help herself. Gerald was pointing to the picture of a man she'd never seen before, but next to it was a face she knew all too well. Sergei Alexandrov. Keith was right. Sergei was involved. She suddenly felt weak. I... Her voice sounded unsteady. She cleared her throat and continued in a cheerier tone. I'll get those drinks then, shall I? Cynthia peered over the rims of her sunglasses at Michelle's suddenly ashen face. Michelle? Two Bloody Marys and some painkillers, wasn't it? What is it, dear? Do you recognise these men? Recognise? Who? Them? Oh, God, no. No, I just thought... <laughs> she laughed nervously. <laughs> I'm sorry. I try not to read the papers, you know. It just depresses me. All this violence and war and talk about recession. I'll just go and get those drinks. She turned and went into the pub. Cynthia and Gerald watched her go to the bar and speak to Louise for a moment before disappearing into the deeper shadows further inside. I say, said Gerald, that seemed to give her a queer turn. Yes. Cynthia looked at the two pictures. Nikolai Alexandrov, nephew of this chap, Sergei Alexandrov, owner of a number of bars and clubs along the Costa del Sol and Costa Blanca. Yes, sounds like Russian mafia shenanigans to me, hm? I really wouldn't know, dear. I'm more concerned with Michelle. She looked as if she'd seen a ghost. Well, Costa Blanca, that's Benidorm, isn't it? Her old neighbourhood. Yes, but she said she didn't recognise any of the men in the pictures. Ah, well, you don't have to recognise a bad egg by sight to have your stomach turned over by one, do you? Sometimes the general whiff is enough. And maybe Michelle caught the whiff of local villainy from these chaps. Yes, Gerald said Cynthia, evidently no longer listening, as she looked to where Michelle's daughter, Melanie, was now emerging from the pub. Cynthia raised a hand. Hello, Melanie. Hiya, said Melanie. How are you? Fine, thank you, dear. And you? How school? Oh, it's all right. Melanie took an awkward step nearer to them. Same as usual. "'I imagine you're the best in the class in English, eh?' said Gerald. Melanie smiled. 
Yeah, I do all right in that. It's maths I have trouble with. Ah, maths, said Gerald knowingly. Never my cup of tea either. History was my subject. Yeah, history's all right, said Melanie. I quite like that. Uh, do you want to be a historian when you leave school? asked Cynthia. No, well, I don't know what I want to be, really. She noticed the newspaper headline and craned her head to read more. What's that? Oh, the chap got his head cut off. Gerald turned the paper so she could see it. Says here he spent a few years in your old hometown. Ugh, Melanie's nose crinkled. That's horrible, isn't it? Yes, said Cynthia, suddenly interested. She pointed casually at Coleman. Do you recognize him? Melanie shook her head. Then she pointed at the picture of Sergei. But I know that bloke. Oh, really? Yeah, he's the one my mum and dad sold our old pub to. He came around a few times, but I don't think mum and dad really liked him very much, especially dad. Hmm, yes, of course. Cynthia nodded sympathetically. It's always hard, the emotional wrench of selling a home. Yeah, I suppose. I know I didn't want to leave. Oh, but you like it here now, though, don't you? asked Gerald. Oh, yeah, I love it. Except, well, you know, it's nice to be near the sea and have cinemas and stuff nearby. So you don't have to always depend on your parents for lifts everywhere. You know. Gerald laughed. Oh, you're becoming quite the independent young lady, aren't you? Yeah, I suppose, said Melanie. Anyway, I've I got to go. Nice to speak to you. She waved and stepped out onto the street. Ah, lovely girl, said Gerald, watching her go. So nice to see good manners in the young, especially these days. Yes, said Cynthia, easing a more mentholated cigarette into her slim black cigarette holder. Charming. I say, it's rather queer how she recognized that Russian chap in the paper and Michelle didn't. Don't you think? He picked up Cynthia's lighter and sparked a flame for her. Yes. Cynthia took a light and sat back, the cigarette holder clamped thoughtfully between her teeth. Very queer indeed. David sat back from the computer monitor and rubbed his eyes. He looked at his watch. It was 2.30. He'd been reading through John's various guides, instructions and history manuals for an hour and a half. He should have kept his studies to the subject of the resurrection, but his reading had turned out to be much wider than he'd originally intended. Earlier, when he'd first keyed his birth date into the code lock on the study door, his uppermost intention had been getting to the safe and the computer disk that held all of John's notes on Underwood. However, Upon entering the room, his attention had been seized by the glass cabinet that held row upon row of old books of varying size, condition, and age. He knew immediately that he must be looking at the flinch diaries. He'd tried the cabinet doors, but they were locked. He'd felt around the cabinet and gone through the drawers of the desk, but found no key. It, too, must be in the safe, he reasoned. He looked around. But there was no sign of any safe. A small portrait of Underwood regarded him from the study wall. This time the vampire wore a white wig and high collar, typical of the Georgian era. The picture was perhaps a hundred years older than the Victorian portrait in the hall, but the face of its subject was unchanged. As far as Underwood's age was concerned, this picture could have been painted just a day before the other one, David looked closer. The ravages of time were only evident in the paint itself. Hundreds of tiny cracks spread across Underwood's face in a way that nature herself never could. David took hold of the gold-leaf frame and tried to lift it. It didn't move. Underwood continued to regard him with cool aplomb. Fucking wanker, David murmured. He felt around the picture frame, and his fingers fell upon a tiny button. He pushed it, and the picture shifted with a light click. The picture was hinged, and David eased it away from the wall. 
Behind it was a safe with a digital keypad. He keyed in his birth date as he had done with the study door, and the safe clicked open. Inside, he saw the computer disk on top of various papers and envelopes. He took the disk and put it on the desk. Then he took out the papers and riffled through them with mild curiosity before tossing them onto the sofa to his right. Where was the key? He reached into the safe and felt around, and his fingers touched the links of a small chain. He gathered it and lifted the thing it was attached to, not a key as he had hoped, but an old, full hunter fob watch. He popped a button at the top, and the front face opened. On the inside of the case, in letters almost faded with ages of polishing, was inscribed, To Daniel, forever yours, Lily. David held the watch to his ear. It was silent. Carefully he wound it up. Nothing happened. He tapped the scratched face with his fingernail, and the second hand suddenly began to move. David swung the portrait back, so he was once again face to face with Underwood. "'Who's Lily, then, eh?' The picture made no reply, and David knew that it was just his imagination, but still he got the feeling that Underwood now seemed a tad less sure of himself than he had done earlier, because David now knew something about Underwood— that perhaps Underwood wouldn't care for him to know. She your, uh, she your girlfriend, was she? Or, or your, your wife? Despite the fact that he was talking to a picture, the question seemed somehow inappropriate. Feeling suddenly uncomfortable, David dropped his eyes back to the watch. He lifted it to his ear and listened to its ticking. It's uh, a good watch you've got here, my lord. They don't make him like this any more. He held up his cheap Casio Digital for the portrait to see. I doubt this will still be keeping time in ten years, let alone, what, two hundred, three hundred years? More? Cautiously, David reached out to touch the painting, but his fingers stopped a few millimetres from its surface. Just how old are you? He stood for perhaps a minute, lost in thought adding decades to his own natural time on earth, going on into the future, imagining himself just as he was now, never ageing, never changing with advancing years. 2008, 2108, 2208, 2308. <sighs> My God! David blinked and refocused his eyes. In the portrait... Underwood seemed to have regained his air of confidence. David shook his head and swung the picture so it was again facing the wall. He reached into the safe and felt around for the key to the bookcase, but there was nothing more inside. He returned the watch and the papers to the safe and closed it, but he decided to leave Underwood facing the wall. He liked him better that way. Now, gazing at the ceiling in reflection, he felt that it was probably just as well he hadn't been able to find the key to the diaries after all. If he had, he might have wasted precious time browsing the adventures of his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and heaven knew how many others. Instead, he'd sat down, turned on the computer, and slipped the disc into the drive— then, opening up the contents of the disc, he'd clicked on the file simply labelled Underwood. Immediately, he'd found himself looking at files that held the answers to every question he'd ever had since childhood. He'd begun clicking on all of them, reading snatches of one thing and whole pages of another. One of his main concerns had been his question of this morning about Underwood's ability to influence things from within his coffin. He'd found something germane in a document entitled Communion, which he'd printed off, and now he leaned forward, took the sheet of paper from the printer, and drew a circle around the key area of text with a red biro. The blood of the sacrifice should be uncontaminated, no sedatives or any other drugs should be used. Secure the sacrifice and extend a limb over the master's mouth. Make a small cart to cross a minor vein so that blood will drop but not jet from the wound. 
This flow of blood should be directed to the master's mouth. It may be necessary to part the master's lips so that the blood can flow more easily into his mouth, but only a little at a time. If nothing happens, withdraw the limb and wait. Do not allow the master's mouth to become filled with blood in case he inhales it and chokes. About a tablespoon's worth should suffice. David raised his eyebrows. It sounded like something out of a cookery book. What the hell did John mean by the sacrifice? A goat? A chicken? David hadn't seen any animals around the place. And did you call goats legs limbs? Could they be intending to use a volunteer human being, someone from the sect who was willing to give their blood? No, that would be a donor, not a sacrifice. So did that mean that perhaps there was someone who was willing to die? Scenes from Hammer movies flashed across his mind. Girls dressed in flimsy white robes, trembling on stone altars, getting turned on by the sight of the curved dagger that was about to be plunged into their heart. Would a sect member, someone like Conchita or Anna, allow themselves to be in that position? They were devoted, yes, but were they that devoted? David lit a cigarette and read on. When the master begins to revive and drink the blood, bleed the sacrifice some more, repeating the process until the master is able to feed for himself. David sat back. Feed for himself? And so what? Drink from the sacrifice? Perhaps unto their death? Surely no one would go willingly to that end. How into something do you have to be to die for it? Was anyone into anything that much? He immediately thought about himself and the other junkies and addicts of the world. Was their relationship, his relationship with narcotics, really that different? Whiskey may be a slower route to the grave than a vampire's teeth, but it'd get you there in the end. Then there was the suicide bombers, of course. They all see their deaths as a necessary sacrifice to the desired long-term end. So was Underwood's resurrection a cause worth dying for? For him, no. But then he was sane. He read on. After feeding, the master may wish to rest, or alternatively may wish to rise and engage with you and the small gathering of the faithful present at the ceremony. This cannot be predicted, however, as we have no record of the effects of such a long period of hibernation. One thing I should stress is the importance of avoiding what the master refers to as Dennis Wheatley-type ceremonial activity. The numbers of those attending should be kept to a minimum. Many in the sect will seek to attend the resurrection, but I urge you to keep numbers to the absolute minimum. I know that many members of the sect are important to both our family's interests and the master's, but he expressly requested that things be discreet. I, personally, would not exceed ten people, including the Guardian. David, if you have returned, then heed this well. Do not let Lydia convince you otherwise. As if on cue, David heard the sound of Lydia's voice in the kitchen, talking to Anna. Finally, he said. He got up and started for the door just as Lydia stepped through it. David, she said brightly. Anna said you wanted to see me. She grinned. I'm almost surprised to see you here. I'd half expected you to be on a flight back to London. No, I'm still here. He sat down again. Where have you been? Didn't you get any of our messages about John? Yes, he's dead. Oh, you got the messages then. Conchita and I, we, we tried to contact you, but your phone was switched off. Lydia slipped off her suit jacket and draped it over the back of David's chair. I had a meeting with clients. I never have my phone switched on during meetings, David. It rings too often. I'm sorry, but I only found out about John this morning when I reached the office. David nodded. Oh, well, I see. Well, you'll be consoled to know that he went peacefully. Yes, of course. Has the undertaker been? He came about an hour ago. Good. So, tell me, what are your plans? Why do you mean? Well, you know, about the things we were talking about yesterday. John's dead, so you don't need to be here any more, so when are you off? David drew on his cigarette. Oh, you're assuming I'm still going. The look of excited expectation on Lydia's face slipped slightly. 
Well, that's what we agreed yesterday. A lot's happened since yesterday, Lydia. Lydia hesitated a second, as if she were not hearing things correctly. Then she said, Look, if you're feeling guilty, David, forget about it. Your family duty is done. If you go now, you could be back in your own life tomorrow morning, back with your students and your girlfriend and your AA meetings. Would it be just like none of this ever happened? David closed the Resurrection Protocols document on the computer screen. Yeah, well, thanks. I appreciate that, but like I say, a lot's happened since yesterday. What do you mean? I've accepted the job as guardian, Lydia. I promised John just before he died that I'd do it, and... David, any promises you make to John can be cremated along with him as far as I'm concerned. No one's going to hold you to your word now. Yes, but he really wanted me to do this, Lydia. I mean me, me specifically. Lydia sat on the edge of the desk. Oh, I see. That's what he told you, is it? Yes. Are you sure that what he really didn't want was a woman in the job? Remember I told you he had a lot of antiquated notions about all that sort of thing? Well, yes, he, he did mention that. What did he say? It doesn't matter. Yes, it does. What reasons did he give? Did he slag me off? I bet he did, didn't he? No, Lydia, he didn't slag you off. He, he just said that you were... He gestured vaguely, trying to think of a euphemism for evil. Not quite cut out for the job. What? Lydia shook her head in astonishment. Is that all the appreciation I get? My God, do you have any idea how hard I've worked for this family? I'm sure you've worked very hard, Lydia. And of course, John must have known that too. But I've built up connections, David, Lydia continued. Connections that, frankly, John was jealous about. The sect is a powerful organisation now, thanks to me. We have people with real power in the world, and I don't just mean those silly little burgermeisters and bicycle-riding coppers of Dad's day. Oh, no. I have major industrialists, millionaires, commissioners of police, and, and I even have a member of the British Parliament, for God's sake. David raised his eyebrows. Really? Who? Oh, wouldn't you like to know? Lydia tapped the side of her nose. Well, I should know, Lydia. I'm the guardian now. I need to know this stuff. Lydia laughed contemptuously. Ha! Do you seriously imagine for a moment that you could run an organisation of this complexity? Why not? I can do anything you can do. Oh, don't talk rot, David. Until a couple of days ago, you didn't give a shit about the family or its business. I bet you wished we'd all just die and never trouble you again, didn't you? David ground out his cigarette. That's... that's not true. Isn't it? No, it's not. David immediately lit another cigarette. Oh, yes, it is. You hate Underwood, you hate your family, and deep down, you hate yourself, too. "'That's the reason you drink, isn't it?' David looked into her eyes, angry now. "'How dare you!' "'Ah!' Lydia smiled and helped herself to one of his cigarettes. "'I've hit a nerve, haven't I?' "'Of course you have, you fucking idiot! "'You're being outrageously offensive! "'You don't know me at all, "'other than from what you've read about "'in some private dick's book of times, dates and half-hour speculations!' "'Oh, no!' She lit a cigarette and eyed him knowingly. I seem to remember I once knew you rather intimately. David pushed the chair back from the desk and got up. That was a long time ago, Lydia. Oh, I see. All water under the bridge now, I suppose. Yes. He walked to the window and looked out. We've got enough on our hands raising one member of the dead as it is. I don't see any point in digging up any other skeletons. So let's just work together and focus on the business at hand. There's a lot to do before sundown. Oh, I know only too well what needs to be done. Really? Well, so how come your plans go directly against Underwood's express wishes as passed on from him to our dad? She frowned. What are you talking about? How many people are coming tonight? Oh, this old chestnut. I see. Five minutes poking around in John's computer and you think you're suddenly the big expert, the high priest of the sect. Well, actually, I think I may be, now that you come to mention it. But that's neither here nor there. How many guests? A few. Thirty? 
More or less. It's too many, Lydia. Even if you discount Underwood's wishes, there's no way we can fit thirty people down in that cellar. Oh, of course we can. At least thirty. Oh, it'll be a bit of a squeeze, granted, but that's no matter. David, I had this out with John a million times. If we want the sect to work for us, then we have to work for it. We need to strengthen our powerful connections. Oh, we don't need powerful connections. Oh, you may not, perhaps, but he does. She pointed to the floor. There are going to be times, many times in the future, when he's going to need help from the highest echelons of society. Underwood can't just go running around killing people willy-nilly any more. We no longer live in a world where you can stick a picture on a passport with a piece of chewing gum and then go anywhere you please. Oh no, it's all digital now, isn't it? Photos, fingerprints, shared information between security services and governments alike. It's not enough for him to have a few bureaucrats in his pocket or police officials to turn blind eyes any more. The world has changed in the last fifty years, especially since nine eleven. So believe me, David. Underwood needs powerful friends, and I've got them. David hadn't thought of this. He paced back and forth across the room a few times before nodding reluctantly. Okay, I agree. You have a point. You mean I'm right? Yes, you're right. But nevertheless, Underwood supposedly stipulated that only a small crowd be present at the resurrection. John reckoned no more than ten. Oh, John! John was an idiot. He was simply parroting what Dad had told him without taking into any account society's evolution. Underwood can't expect to wake up in the 1958 he dozed off in. Things have changed. He's waking up to the internet and and mobile phones, global warming, and and. She waved her hand, trying to think of another example. Cold play. David nodded. Yeah, what a wonderful world. Maybe he'll just roll over and go back to sleep. No,、oh, I don't know. Lydia shrugged. I quite like their early stuff. Yeah, all right. Forget about that. Just tell me straight up how many people are coming. I've invited forty-three. Forty-three. Anna said up to thirty. Well, she was quoting my last figure, but I've just updated her. We need to make sure there are enough canopies. No way. I agree. You have a point with the whole changed world argument, but John was right too. We have to respect Underwood's wishes. Thirty people is too many. Forty-three is just plain madness. I mean, it's not a bloody Tardis down there. So what? You're you're telling me I have to cancel people? Yes, you have to cancel people. Jesus Christ, David! I can't. It's humiliating. Well, you don't need to take the blame. You can tell him it was my decision. You. <laughs> They don't even know who you are. Who are you? I'm the guardian, Lydia. In case you haven't noticed, I'm not sipping a diet Pepsi on the plane back to England. I'm here, and I'm running this show from now on. Lydia's face was turbulent with stifled rage. David squared up to her, eye to eye. So, please cancel people. She folded her arms tightly across her chest. How many? Well, I'm happy to compromise. How about we whittle things down to about twenty guests? That includes us and house staff like Anna. Twenty? I've got twenty people from Spain alone who want to come. Well, that's just too bad, Lydia. Twenty, no more. Christ, you're worse than fucking John. Lydia, please don't speak that way about John. He was our brother, and he's just died. Oh, so what? His death should have been my ascension. Oh, but he didn't want me, did he? Oh no, balls only in the guardian's trousers. Even when the ascendant guardian has none, it's just not bloody fair. Life isn't fair, is it, Lydia? I mean, I didn't ask for this any more than you did. Lydia clenched her fists and let go a part stifled scream. Oh, so don't take it. Pack your horse and cart and leave. I'll take responsibility with Underwood. Believe me, I know what I'm doing, and Underwood will understand. Even applaud it when he's fully restored to us. David wanted to put his hands over his ears. More than that, he wanted a drink. He took a deep breath and spoke slowly, as if he were addressing a child. 
Lydia, I promised John that I'd take this job. And for reasons of my own, I do take it. So can we please stop this bickering and get on with what needs to be done? Lydia glowered at him. David ignored her and went on. As guardian, I'll be overseeing all matters regarding tonight's ceremony, and that includes conducting the resurrection ritual itself. Are you sure? He bites, you know. Yeah, well, he won't bite me, will he? No flinch shall bleed. It says that here. He tapped the computer monitor. Oh, you know about that, do you? Of course, said David. The founding promise between Underwood and Matthew Flinch. You mean Matthias? Yeah, yeah, him. Underwood won't bite me or you. We're both safe. Unless he decides to choke you to death, of course. Yet he won't. See, I've thought about it. That's more than a promise not to bite us, Lydia. It's a promise never to do any harm to members of the Flinch line. Lydia smiled. Oh, is it? Isn't it? She exhaled smoke in his direction. Stick around. Maybe you'll find out. Yeah, well, I will stick around, don't you worry. Which reminds me, in his notes here, John goes on about a sacrifice. So, what are you planning on using? Lydia inclined her head slightly. Pardon? What are you planning to use as a sacrifice? An animal? A volunteer donor? Er... Uh, Lydia's expression was a mixture of amusement and disbelief. What do you mean, an animal? Well, you know, a chicken. Something like that. Like Dad used to kill in his nutty rituals when we were kids. You seriously think we're going to raise the Lord of the Undead with a chicken? David shrugged. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, that's why I'm asking you. As he spoke, something in her mocking smile sent a chill through him. Lydia shook her head and laughed. <laughs> you see, this is what I mean. Are you willfully trying not to understand? Or are you just genuinely stupid? David didn't know what to say. He considered a moment. Then he said, so you, you mean you intend to use a person? Lydia gawped at him sarcastically. Er, uh, yeah. What, so you've got like a donor? Someone who's prepared to give some of their blood? No, but you're getting warmer. David felt the skin on his back prickle. You have someone who's willing to die? Lydia tilted her hand in a so-so gesture. Warmer. David was having difficulty reconciling the smile on Lydia's face with the conclusion she was driving him to. Y you mean you're going to kill someone who isn't willing to die? Bingo! But that's murder! Hello? Murder is the family business, David, in case you'd forgotten. These last fifty years have been an aberration, a vacation from the norm. But now the holidays are over, and the flinches are back in business. Or should I say you're back in business, since it now seems that I can go back to my little estate agent life and just leave you to take care of all the murder and skullduggery. David sank down onto the sofa. Lydia continued. Unless, as I say, you don't quite have the balls for it, in which case, no problem, because I do. David stared at her in disbelief. How? Lydia, how can you be so casual about something so horrifying? Uh, well, how can you not? I mean, it's not like it's some big surprise. You've always known about it. Well, I guess... He looked down at the back of his hands. I guess uh, I thought it would never actually fall to me to have to deal with it. I was the third in line. Well, fourth if we count me, but uh, of course we don't. I never thought I'd actually be in this position. I just thought I could go on and, well, forget about it. With a little help from your friends Jack Daniels and Johnny Walker? David nodded. Do you miss them? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. They make the forgetting easier, at least in the short term. Lydia came over and sat down beside him. She laid a hand on his knee. David, please, 
I'm offering you the opportunity to carry on forgetting, with or without alcohol. Underwood doesn't have to be in your future, not as long as he's in mine. Thanks. I appreciate that, Lydia, but tell me. He turned to her, his expression grave. Where is this sacrifice of yours? Lydia frowned. Why? Where are you keeping them? Well, you don't need to know. I, I think it's best if you just leave all that to me, don't you? David got up. Take me to the sacrifice. She stood up and blocked his way to the door. David, for fuck's sake, just go. You're not cut out for this. I'm the guardian, Lydia, and I'm ordering you to tell me where the sacrifice is. No, I won't. You're going to spoil everything. She pushed him. Why don't you just go back to fucking England? David staggered a little. He realised his fists were clenched. He took a deep breath and relaxed his hands. Then, after correcting his posture, he walked past Lydia and out into the hall. Lydia ran after him. David, just just wait a minute. Uh, maybe you're right. Uh, maybe we could just drain him a little bit. David stopped with his back to her. Oh, it's a him, is it? So where is he? He's not here, said Lydia unconvincingly. He's somewhere safe, where he can't be found. David turned on her. Don't lie to me, Lydia. He's here somewhere, in an outhouse maybe, or, or somewhere down in the cellarage. Her eyes shifted from him for a second. He smiled. Ah, so he's down in the cellarage, is he? He turned and headed in the direction of the east wing of the house, and a passage down to a part of the cellar that was separate from Underwood's crypt, a storehouse where they had always kept logs and hung Serrano ham. David! Lydia hurried after him. You can't just do this! We need that boy! He's young and strong and full of good A. Reese's positive! He strode on ahead of her. He's a person, Lydia! Oh, for God's sake, stop being such a prig! He reached the cellar door. It was locked. He turned back to Lydia. Unlock it. I don't have a key. He reached up on top of the door frame and found the key. Oh, here it is. He unlocked the door and pulled it open. Coolness rose to meet him, and something else. The bitter smell of excrement. He looked at her. Anger etched deep into his brow. Lydia shrugged. Oh, for heaven's sake, what did you expect? The Ritz? David flicked on the cellar light, and from below a voice cried out in surprise. David pushed past Lydia and descended the stairs. There was a shuffling sound, and David saw a shape stumbling in the shadows along the far wall. The layout was similar to Underwood's crypt, with a single bulb hanging over the centre of the floor. David approached the figure slowly. Hey, it's okay now. You're going to be all right. The young man reached a wooden table. He picked up a sack and pulled it over his head. But in the seconds before he managed to hide his face, David recognised him. He turned to Lydia. Jesus Christ, Lydia! he hissed. That's the kid in the posters at the airport. Lydia put her hand over his mouth. Shh, keep your voice down, he's English, he'll understand you. Have you gone completely mad? There's a fucking manhunt going on for this guy. Oh, it's no big deal, a couple of posters in an airport or a bus terminal here and there. He's a middle-class junkie, a rent boy. Those posters were put there by his family. The police themselves couldn't care less. David stared at his sister, aghast. Oh, and that's all right, is it? Well, it's not a problem, if that's what you're asking, though I suspect it's not. You're bloody right it's not. He looked at the young man, who now stood with his back turned to them. What's the bag for? So he can't see our faces. That way, when we let him go, he won't be able to identify us. But you're not going to let him go. Well, I know that, but he doesn't. It just makes the whole situation a lot easier to deal with, for him as well as us. David's horror deepened. Jesus, Lydia, this is monstrous. No, David, this is business. Underwood needs fresh blood. I got it for him. 
But you just said he's a junkie. His blood's got all kinds of shit in it. Maybe even disease. No, we screened his blood for disease early on. He's clean. After that, it was just a case of weaning him off the smack. Which was a piece of cake, actually. All this stuff you hear about heroin withdrawal being tough is nonsense. The trick is not to pamper them. All I needed was this cellar and a gun. And look at the results. I ought to start a clinic. You think this is funny, Lydia? Funny? God, no. You should have seen the mess he made when... Stop it! David raised his hand before her face. Just don't. You're making me feel sick. Lydia rolled her eyes and placed her hands on her hips. Fine. David looked back at the young man. Where did you take him from? One of my people found him in Torremolinos. Does he have a name? Who? Him? Yes, him. Gavin. David looked around the room. On the table next to Gavin were a couple of books, a dirty bowl and a spoon. Against the opposite wall was a rusty single bed, and in the far corner, covered by a towel, was a plastic bucket. A roll of toilet paper lay on the floor beside it. David went over to the bucket and lifted it. He felt the weight and brought it back to Lydia. It needs emptying. Lydia took it and set it back on the floor. I'll tell Anna. David picked it up again and held it out to her. Lydia, this is your mess, not Anna's. Now you can either leave here carrying it in a bucket or wearing it all over that expensive suit of yours. But one way or the other, it's leaving with you. She sighed and took the bucket. You know, one day you're going to regret this, David. Perhaps. He went over to Gavin and gently called him by his name. Gavin tensed. It's okay. My name's David. I'm a friend. Please, d don't hurt me. I'm not going to hurt you, Gavin. I'm going to get you out of here. Beneath the sack, Gavin's head turned towards the sound of David's voice. Y you are? Has my family paid the ransom? David looked at Lydia. She shrugged nonchalantly. He turned back to Gavin. Yes, they've paid. Oh, thank God. But listen, I can't get you out right away, because there are some things that I need to do first. Things I, I need to organise, like transport. Do you understand? No. Gavin stepped away from David, his hands outstretched behind him, groping for the wall. No, you're going to kill me, aren't you? No, 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 Gavin, I promise. You haven't seen us and, and we have the money, so we can let you go. All I need you to do is cooperate with me for just a little longer, OK? Do, do you really mean it? There was hope in Gavin's voice. Yes, I really mean it. From inside the sack came the sound of sobbing as Gavin began to cry, thanking him now over and over again. David felt his own tears pricking at his eyes, and he took a second to suppress them. Then he took Gavin gently by the shoulders and led him to the bed. It's okay, here. Just, just rest now and I'll be back soon. He turned to Lydia and his face darkened with rage. Upstairs, we need to talk. Lydia sighed with exaggerated boredom as he took her by the arm and led her up the stairs. All right, take it easy, Jesus. I wouldn't want to spill any slops from the bucket on your sandals. Once they were back in the corridor, David closed the door and said, Last night, Lydia, John told me you were evil. Now I know cancer victims can get bitter and angry, and I thought maybe it was just a disease talking, but I can see now that it wasn't. You really are evil, aren't you? She smiled. David... What kind of thing is that to say to your only sister? How could you do a thing like this to another human being? Lydia folded her arms. How could I do this? She laughed. <laughs> you seem to think that this was all my idea and that dear brother John was completely unaware of it all. David said nothing, but his jaw tightened. Oh, yes, that's right. I don't know whether John lost his evil marbles in his last moments in this world, but if you think he wanted me to pop down to the nearest farmyard and grab a couple of chickens for the resurrection, then you need to think again. 
Lydia leaned in close to David, letting the bucket knock against his knees. All of this, all of it, was done following John's explicit instructions, instructions given to him by our father, who in turn got them from Lord Underwood. She smiled. And we must adhere to Lord Underwood's instructions, mustn't we, David? David turned and walked away down the corridor. Lydia chuckled and called after him. You know, you could always try to round up a few rabbits to sacrifice, David. There's always plenty of those hopping around. <laughs> Just empty the bucket, Lydia, David called without turning. Empty the fucking bucket. Thank you for listening to Underwood and Flinch. At the time of me posting this episode, the podcast is incomplete here at YouTube because I can't just chuck podcast episodes up here as they are. They need to be uh, re-edited and converted into videos and then uploaded. So more episodes will be added in time. If the next episode has been uploaded, you'll see a link to it on your screen in a moment. But if it's not, don't despair. The podcast is complete, along with seasons two and three, with a fourth in progress at the time of recording this, wherever you get your podcasts. You can find links in the description below. Thank you.